Unlike the last occasion on which we gathered for dinner in Britannia, I'm delighted to see you all here on time and in good order. <laughs> It is essentially a family gathering. Like all the best families, we have our share of eccentricities, of impetuous and wayward youngsters, <laughs> and of family disagreements. But we also have our wise uncles and aunts and the solid, dependable family members on whom everyone relies. We are gathered together in this ancient naval dockyard of Portsmouth this afternoon to worship Almighty God and to commemorate the paying off of the Royal Yacht Britannia. After more than 43 years of distinguished service, to Her Majesty the Queen. We recall with thanksgiving the contribution made by the members of the Royal Yacht Service and the Royal Household, past and present, in Britannia's historic career in the service of the Crown at home and abroad. We mark with affection the part that the Royal Yacht has played through her distinctive presence throughout the world. We acknowledge the contribution made by those who share with us in this ceremony, but upon another shore and in a greater light, whose loyalty and devotion is known to God alone. In the difficult days after the Second World War, the shipyards of the Clyde in Glasgow were struggling. There were no more warships to be built, and the halcyon days of the passenger liners had long gone. King George VI was on the throne, a leader who had earned the love and respect of his kingdom, leading them to victory alongside the great wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill. When VE Day finally happened, George and his family were in the palace and this great cry went up, we want the king, we want the king. And I think that although he was overawed by it, and although obviously being a naturally shy and retiring man, it was a lot for him to take on. It was still a recognition that over the course of the Second World War, he had gone from being this figure who had been regarded with a sense of suspicion, a sense of distrust almost by the public who had preferred his brother, to being this lauded figure, along with Churchill, who was there on the balcony with him, that, that the two men were seen as absolutely indistinguishable in terms of their contribution to, to the war effort, in terms of their importance for the British national character. And I think he, he ended the war in an exceptionally popular monarch. Then the King and Queen appear for a great reception, with Princess Elizabeth, now 19, and Princess Margaret Rose, now 15 years old. Today, Britain, emerging from the war with a proud sense of duty well done, faces the grave problems of peace. I think it's fair to say that the two things that destroyed George's health and led him to an early death were first of all his becoming king at all, and secondly the sheer stress of what he had to do in World War II, because if a, if a war had never happened, if a peace had been sought with Hitler but had then been agreed, he may have lived longer, but he was faced with the most horrendous stress and pressure. You can understand why, if you've been faced with that level of trauma, it's not gonna be something you can walk away from very easily. George VI, uh, who had, as a young man, often suffered from ill health, um, 
became quite ill as a result of the, the Second World War. The stress of the conflict told on him. He was a heavy smoker, uh, and by 1945, uh, his, his health was actually very poor. George knew that he was very ill towards the end of his life. He knew that he was a committed cigarette smoker. He was somebody who'd he'd always drunk quite heavily as well. He was somebody who knew that his health was not great. But on the other hand, he was being told by his doctors that operations that he'd had were successful. I mean, he had, he had a large portion of his lung removed, that he was going to be okay. So the fact that he was dying was kept from him, but it was also commonly known within the wider echelons of the courtiers that he didn't have all that long, and that Elizabeth was likely to become queen far before anyone could have reasonably expected. World War II had taken its toll. King George VI was suffering as a result of the stresses and strains of war, and his health was fast declining. Dutiful as he was, he wanted to continue his royal role to the best of his abilities. A new royal yacht was commissioned in the hope it would allow the king to travel more comfortably. The John Brown shipyard received the commission from the Admiralty on the 4th of February 1952. Just two days later, King George VI died. Now at King's Cross, the royal train draws in. Before the queen, his daughter. The widowed queen, his wife. As George VI returns to his sorrowing capital. John Brown & Co. was one of the most famous shipyards in the world, having built the famous liners Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. The keel of the new, as yet unnamed, royal yacht was laid down in June 1952. One of the last fully riveted ships to be built. With a remarkably smooth painted hull, she was finally ready to be launched on the 16th of April 1953. The ship's name was a closely guarded secret, only being revealed when Queen Elizabeth II launched her and smashed a bottle of Empire wine on the hull of the yacht. Champagne was considered too extravagant in post-war Britain. I name the ship Britannia. I wish success to her and to all who sail in her. Her Majesty releases the traditional bottle, not of champagne this time, but of empire wine. Britannia was made with two purposes in mind. Not only to be a floating royal residence, but also to double as a seafaring hospital during wartime. Although it had been commissioned for George VI, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip had the final say in the design of the yacht. Perhaps surprisingly, its interior design was quite understated but classic and elegant. A reflection of the post-war austerity. It was one of the few residences the Queen felt was hers, not restricted by adhering to the look of historic palace walls. It could be designed to suit her own wants and needs. The signature blue paint on the hull of the yacht was inspired by one of the couple's wedding gifts, the racing yacht blue bottle. Prince Philip became a skilled sailor often competing in sailing competitions. The Royal Yacht Britannia became a frequent sight at the Cow's Regatta in the Isle of Wight. Regatta each year attracts the world's best sailors, and usually they find the Royal Yacht Britannia in their midst and Prince Philip there competing in the Dragon Class races. The Queen and Prince Philip were joint owners of this little racing boat, Blue Bottle, and Cow's Regatta would hardly be the same if the Prince wasn't there to preside and take a sporting part in events. In 1953, following her coronation, Queen Elizabeth, accompanied by her husband, Prince Philip, set off on the longest tour of their royal careers. Into 
the crown colony of Aden come Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh on the last lap of their six-month round-the-world tour. One of the smallest of the British possessions, Aden, located east of Suez, occupies a peninsula at the southern end of the Red Sea. Here, colorful ceremonies for their monarch from across the world. From Aiden's prettiest twins, Elizabeth receives a bouquet at the RAF hospital. Although here for only one day, the Queen still finds time to visit the patients. Well, the Commonwealth was really important to the Queen because it was the old empire, really. The empire became the Commonwealth, and it was her father that inst instigated the Commonwealth instead of the empire. And the Queen felt it was her duty, not business, duty, to pull that Commonwealth together and to really make it the Commonwealth of Nations, which it became. And, the, you know, Prince Philip used to say, it's her baby, it's her family, and it was. Especially in the, when the Queen first came to the throne, she had to be visible, you know, television was still embryonic. And she, need, she needed to see her people, every monarch needs to see their people. And that's what she did. Round the world tour to the far-flung domains of the Commonwealth, the first made by a reigning monarch. In King George's Park, named for her late father, the Winsome Queen plants a cottonwood tree, part of the island's reforestation program. Next stop, the Fiji Islands, halfway round the world. This Commonwealth tour visited nations far and wide and left their two children, the young Charles and Anne, back at the palace. The young prince and princess, missing their dear parents, would join them on the final leg of their tour. The Royal Yacht Britannia set sail for the first time on official royal duty. On board, Charles and Anne became the first royals to enjoy life at sea on Britannia. Warships of the British Navy escort the Royal Yacht to the island of Malta. On board, the reunited royal family. At this Mediterranean outpost, famed during World War II, the royal youngsters steal the show. Five-year-old Prince Charles greets Governor Sir Gerald Creasy and Lady Creasy, as does his sister, three-year-old Princess Anne. Now it's tradition for the moment, as the official duties of empire fall to Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh. Valletta, the capital of Malta, is decked out in regal display for their monarchs. Here, a vantage point on the balcony for the royal youngsters as the island's military and naval units pass in review. The parade over, the children in their first official appearance on Queen Elizabeth's six-month Commonwealth tour become part of the royal motorcade. Newsmen on the scene are impressed with the bearing of the youngsters, even though they often revert to the role of just plain children. Next stop, Gibraltar, and then home to England. This is Tobruk, a scene of desert peace in 1954, a name deep carved in the memory of all our generation. A few miles away on the tarmac at El Adam, landed the aircraft bearing the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh from Uganda, and at anchor in the bay was the new royal yacht. But first, a guard of honor saluted the Queen's arrival on the North African coast. In this foreign field lie nearly 2,500, most of them killed in the eighth month siege of Tobruk in 1941. Mostly from Britain and Australia, the dead here also number men from New Zealand, South Africa, India, Canada, and Poland. This way, too, passed the victorious Eighth Army in the decisive desert victory. The cemetery is maintained by the Imperial War Graves Commission. From it, the Queen and Duke drove to the palace of King Idris I, monarch of Libya since December 1951. His country was the first new state to be founded under the United Nations. 64-year-old King Idris reigns over a scattered population of a little more than a million. Aboard Britannia were the royal children, whom Her Majesty and the Duke rejoined after saying goodbye to King Idris. The Queen and Prince Philip joined Charles and Anne on board Britannia and made their way first to Gibraltar where the young Princess Anne reveled in feeding the apes. Britannia then made the last leg of the Commonwealth tour, bringing the Queen home. For the first time, the yacht made its way up the Thames. 
shouting and cheering welcomed a weary queen home. Britain's Queen and her family aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia arriving from the Channel to the Thames for the triumphant return to London. Behind is a journey of nearly 50,000 miles. Six months circling the globe to knit the bonds of unity in the British Commonwealth. For this occasion, the Thames Great Commercial Waterway forgets its commerce and is a royal highway. At Tower Bridge, gateway to London, even the giant cranes dip and salute. As their tour was drawing to a close, the Queen and the Duke were joined at Tobruk by their children, Prince Charles and Princess Anne. The youngsters now share in the welcome home tribute. The Royal Barge is bringing Britain's first family to Westminster Pier. Soon the 28-year-old Queen, who endeared herself to subjects around the world, will once more stand on the soil of Britain. Formality bows before the realism of a royal youngster, just a child. <laughs> Members of the government, led by Prime Minister Winston Churchill, welcome Elizabeth and the Duke. A scene to warm the heart as Princess Margaret and the Queen Mother are photographed with the returning monarch, who hardly tries to disguise her joy. Then the ride to Buckingham Palace as uncounted thousands wait to add their tributes. The second coronation, the press holds the event, recalling that historic day, June 2nd, 1953, when a young and radiant lady stepped onto the throne. In a world where in too many places there is yet turmoil, this spectacle offers a refreshing interlude. As well as its diplomatic uses, Britannia was frequently used by the family for holidays and honeymoons. Being so far away from the press and the public offered the family a real sense of privacy. In 1958, Margaret met Anthony Armstrong Jones, but it wasn't love at first sight. It took many months for romance to begin to grow. At the time, Princess Margaret was one of the most eligible women around and she attended many parties, to which she would invite Tony too. Still, many other eligible men were also in attendance, so the press did not pick up on their blossoming romance. They kept it all extremely quiet. Tony proposed to Margaret in February of 1960, and the public was thrilled at the prospect of a royal wedding. Wedding day rehearsal of Princess Margaret and Anthony Armstrong Jones with lots of excitement in Britain. Public attention is focused on last minute preparations for the procession of the wedding couple from Westminster Abbey to Buckingham Palace. Because nobody knew that she and Tony Armstrong Jones were seeing one another, when their engagement was announced, it, it really was a massive surprise. You know, the media was reeling partly through enthusiasm and excitement. Like, who, is, who is this man? He's a photographer. He's one of us. You know, he, he, he worked in Fleet Street. He was, a, he was a fashion designer, a fashion photographer, a society photographer. He was part of the, uh, of the press, you know. And they didn't know of, they had no idea that he even knew Princess Margaret. So there was this immense surprise. In May 1960, Prince Philip accompanied Margaret down the aisle in place of her late father, a gesture that showed the fondness Margaret must have had for her sister's husband. She said to me that um, Prince Philip kept coming into her room and saying, if you don't hurry up, we're going to be late. As though her being the bride, it mattered whether or not she was going to be late. And um, she also, part of uh, uh, the fashion correspondence picked up, was that she wore a hairpiece curled as a chignon inside the Baltimore tiara that she was wearing. Um, she said, we're rather hoping that was going to stay on. 
It was the first royal wedding to be broadcast on television and was estimated to attract 300 million viewers. The young royal rebel wanted to do something different for her honeymoon. So following their marriage, the couple took to the seas on board the royal yacht and traveled to the Caribbean. With beautiful vistas and delightfully warm weather, the couple visited Trinidad and Antigua. But one of their wedding gifts was a small plot on the island of Mustique. So the couple spent much of their honeymoon exploring the island. Years later, Margaret would build a beautiful home on the plot and visit regularly. before the wedding were happy ones. The couple attended many events as wedding fever gripped the nation. The more she attended, the better she coped. Years later, in February 1981, Charles and Diana announced their engagement. She now faced possibly the most daunting initiation test for would-be members of the royal family, ordeal by the media. Her flat came under siege. She was followed wherever she went. Even under this pressure, she stayed calm, and in doing so, she won respect. How well you're coping with all the press attention? Well, as you can, you can see, you can tell. <laughs> are, you, are you bearing up with it quite well, though? Because it must be quite a strain with all of us after you. Well, it is, naturally. In February 1981, the waiting was over. Buckingham Palace announced that Prince Charles and Lady Diana were engaged. <laughs> the ring was a sapphire surrounded by diamonds. The couple looked happy and relaxed, delighted, like everyone else, that a wedding would take place. Yesterday, you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales, and, and one day you would, well, I know, like it would be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, who, I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden a transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. Yes. So. Well, it you obviously means, your own interpretation. Uh, obviously means two very happy people. Yes. Well, yes. Congratulations. congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Their courtship attracted a lot of attention from the press, the media chasing Diana wherever she went. And following this announcement, that excitement and interest only grew. On the 29th of July, 1981, the young couple made their way to St. Paul's Cathedral with a congregation of 3,500 people and 2 million people lining Diana's route from Clarence House. A quick look all along the route, see what it looks like as more and more people, as you've been telling us, are out and about. The best places are filling up and everyone's making sure it's going to be a great day. Buckingham Palace, which has seen so many royal brides since the young Queen Victoria was its first marrying Prince Albert 141 years ago. The royal carriages, the Queen's procession and Prince Charles's little procession will drive down the leafy mall to Admiralty Arch in the distance. And five minutes after the Prince of Wales has passed, Lady Diana and her father will come out from Clarence House in the glass coach, just with police outriders, for she's not royal yet, and will follow her husband-to-be to St Paul's. Just a little while to go before this St. Paul's meets its first royal bride, Lady Diana. And the great door is not yet open. She was still Lady Di, but only just. 
She was about to become the first English girl in 500 years to marry a Prince of Wales. The eyes of the world were on her and she knew it. It was a day full of anticipation and excitement. Accompanied by her father, John Spencer, Diana traveled to St. Paul's Cathedral in the glass carriage. With father on her arm, she then walked the three and a half minutes up the aisle. She seemed remarkably free from nerves at the age of 20, beginning a new and very different life. He said, you look wonderful. She said, wonderful for you. The service was followed by the crowd outside in the sunshine. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. She was the Princess of Wales, married to the heir to the throne. Another chapter in the thousand-year history of the British royal family had been written. Following the great celebration, the couple boarded Britannia and indulged in a peaceful honeymoon away from prying eyes. Sailing the Mediterranean in the peak of summer, the couple enjoyed the luxuries of the yacht. They managed to remain so private, it was nicknamed the Ghost Yacht. The yacht was also home to the honeymoon of Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips in 1973, as they traveled the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans as well as Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson, who flew to the Azores Islands, spending five days aboard Britannia in the Atlantic. Charles and Diana would continue to use the yacht for family holidays, later taking their sons, William and Harry, on adventures aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia. But now the time had come to say goodbye to Nassau, and the celebrated Royal Bahamas police band did the honours. The Queen was much taken with them. Indeed, we were soon to discover she was entranced by them. They played Old Lang Syne for her as Britannia prepared to sail. The Royal staff caught the atmosphere. And then the Bahamians upped the tempo to double-time Calypso, and that did the trick. The men who caused that most unusual reaction played on as Britannia sailed away. Anthony Carthew, ITM, in Nassau. Next morning, Britannia sailed into the home port of the Malaysian Navy, Lamut, bringing the Queen on a short visit to the state of Perak and to the town of Ipoh. Britannia became a great asset to the United Kingdom as a venue for diplomatic visits. Queen Elizabeth, or members of her family, would travel around the world in the floating palace. It gave the Queen an opportunity to meet with diplomats, presidents, prime ministers, and other state officials. But she certainly seemed to enjoy the more robust Silat, the Malay martial art equivalent of Chinese Kung Fu. By the time the Queen's motorcade roared to its next stop, the weather had changed in this season of monsoons, and the children waiting at Ipoh Airport were caught in a thunderous downpour. After meeting and visiting different countries, Queen Elizabeth could then host her own reception in the Royal Yacht Britannia. Be this a private function with limited invites or a large reception for members of the Commonwealth. She remains one of the most well-traveled monarchs in history, on board Britannia, she conducted her Silver Jubilee tour, visiting countries from Sydney to Bombay, from Canada to Fiji. In the years that followed, she would visit Kuwait, the Caribbean, Singapore, and many more. 
She greeted the outgoing Secretary General Sonny Ramphail, and the Queen was delighted to welcome Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and Pakistan's return to the Commonwealth. The Queen reminded her guests that when they last met for dinner on Britannia in Nassau four years ago, they'd lost their way at sea and were late. Unlike the last occasion on which we gathered for dinner in Britannia, I'm delighted to see you all here on time and in good order. <laughs> It is essentially a family gathering. Like all the best families, we have our share of eccentricities, of impetuous and wayward youngsters, <laughs> and of family disagreements. But we also have our wise uncles and aunts, <laughs> and the solid, dependable family members on whom everyone relies. This is the Queen's 21st visit to Commonwealth conferences, and to mark it, there was a cake. I shall cut it. This is too much like hard work to blow up. <laughs> the Queen had begun her visit to Southeast Asia with persistent echoes of Britain's colonial past. It ended with an extraordinary image of the new Commonwealth partnership. My memories of South Africa are part of me, and I have wanted to return to this magnificent country. One of the Queen's most famous speeches was conducted from South Africa. When she was just 21 years old, she dedicated her life to service and to duty. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. It was on a special visit following World War II, accompanied by her father, the King, her mother and her sister. Since that trip and the apartheid, she was not able to return. However, in 1995, Queen Elizabeth made one of her most significant state visits. Following South Africa's first fully democratic elections, after the disestablishment of the apartheid regime, Nelson Mandela was elected president by his people. The Britannia departed for Cape Town, South Africa, where the Queen finally returned, accompanied by Prince Philip, and underwent a week-long visit. It was significant, as it was thought to be the final, official acceptance of its return into the Commonwealth of Nations. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh then drove through the packed Cape Town streets to a private meeting with the President, where she awarded Mr Mandela the Order of Merit, the highest honour that can be bestowed on a foreigner by the Queen. Palace officials say it's a personal gift to reflect her admiration for the man imprisoned for 27 years for his stand against apartheid. Today, the Queen addressed a multiracial legislature and paid tribute to the country's transition to democracy. My memories of South Africa are part of me, and I have wanted to return to this magnificent country. That wish has never deserted me through a half century, during which you have seen turmoil and tragedy. Now, though, you have become one nation whose spirit of reconciliation is a shining example to the world. Queen Elizabeth even ignored security advice, which encouraged her not to visit the black townships, which she attended anyway. Queen Elizabeth awarded Nelson Mandela with the Order of Merit. They built a strong relationship, one of fondness and admiration. Although the yacht's primary use was to transport the Queen and her family, 
It had been built as a multi-purpose vessel. In 1986, the Royal Yacht Britannia evacuated hundreds of refugees from war-torn South Yemen, an act which fulfilled the late Queen Father's dream that it should serve during times of distress. Safely ashore and out of the sound of gunfire for the first time in six days, work began on getting Britannia's 39 British passengers home. Emergency passports were issued by the embassy staff to those who'd been forced to leave everything behind during the evacuation. For others, some sporting newly acquired Britannia t-shirts and other more menacing souvenirs, it was a chance to relax. The mummy arrived on the beach in the morning, just as the sun was coming up, and we saw these little green and red lights and little boats coming into the beach. And in the distance, we saw just Britannia, maybe a mile offshore. It was quite a satisfying feeling. Well, it's funny, the worst moment was one that wasn't really the most serious. It was when the ammunition dump blew up opposite the hotel, and there was just continuous gunfire. So we thought we were in the middle of crossfire of tanks, and it went on for maybe um, two hours. So what was your, your worst moment over the last five days? The dump went up in the basement. For you. What was yours? <laughs> leaving Aden Beach. Leaving Aden. Where, where did you find this? This was embedded in my uh, bedroom. Uh, it's woke me up fairly sharply at 5 30 on Tuesday morning. What is it? It's a bazooka, I believe. I don't know from where. But these were going off all around the hotel and make a lot of noise. But luckily, not too much damage. The evacuation has been a remarkable success. In the Horn of Africa, an area of fierce east west rivalry, the multinational rescue operation has been a model of international cooperation. And for that, Many of these people coming ashore today owe their lives. Britannia remained in port less than 12 hours. With her band making up for the Royal Yacht's muted arrival, Britannia slipped her moorings and headed back to Aden, 150 miles across the Gulf, to assist in the rescue of the remaining civilians stranded in the war-torn capital. The Queen and Prince Philip visited the Channel Islands in 1989. Perhaps a little known fact, to the islanders, the Queen was fondly known as the Duke of Normandy. Historically, the islands were once part of the Duchy of Normandy, which, in 1066, both Normandy and England came under the rule of William the Conqueror. Though England lost Normandy in 1204, the dear Channel Islands remained loyal to the crown, becoming a self-governing crown dependency. Whilst the islands retain their independence in government, they owe allegiance to the crown and the Duke of Normandy. Whether the monarch is male or female, the title remains Duke. Although the title is no longer official, it's very popular among the islands, representing the unique relationship with the monarchy. The late queen would always use this title when she visited. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip docked in Guernsey's harbor greeted by hundreds of well-wishers and boats lining the yacht's entrance. After visiting the island, they invited 120 local dignitaries on board for a reception. The couple later visited Alderney and Sark too. In 1994, the Conservative government, led by Prime Minister John Major, decided the yacht would be too expensive to keep running. Although, as they came up for election, the Conservative government changed their stance. Unfortunately, in 1997, a final decision was made to decommission the yacht by the Labour government. The expense was thought to be too extravagant in an economic crisis. This came to the great dismay of Queen Elizabeth, who hoped for another yacht to be commissioned in its place. The last few days, Britannia, marine band playing, has sailed the Gulf, her proud crew nursing the 44-year-old vessel gingerly into three different ports, aiming to do business for Britain with the locals in Kuwait, Bahrain and Qatar. Originally, the royal family monopolised Britannia, the ship cosseted for long seaborne state visits, private holidays, even honeymoons. The staterooms for royal use today are plush, but comfortable rather than eye-catchingly opulent. But as the museum piece of an engine room proved when we were shown round the Britannia, this is an old-fashioned ship, costing £10 million annually to run, much more than she cost to build. 
Supporters say Gleam and Glitter's part of an asset which this last voyage will spend 17 days hosting receptions, conferences, lunches and dinners to encourage foreign deal-making. Critics doubt whether the Royal Yacht is such a national asset that the taxpayer should be called upon to fund a £60 million replacement. They argue that business people the world over are too hard-headed to be impressed by such surroundings, however splendid. Another day in the Gulf for the yacht and for her crew. More functions aboard to prepare for. Below, galley chefs work on food a top restaurant would be happy with. Bought, of course, with taxpayers' money, once for royal consumption, now mostly for business people. The skipper is convinced that the Royal Yacht continues to be a worthwhile deployment of government funds. It's always very difficult to be able to tie down with Britannia uh, precise quantification uh, of uh, a particular trade deal or a particular contract or whatever it may be. But there's no doubt about it that the uh, sense that Britannia brings to those discussions uh, and the colour that she, she adds to it, drawing the people to her and the lovely events that we stage manage on board for their benefit uh, are all very much part of, of, of the success. The arguments continue where the British royalty and the Britannia are absolutely vital to impress many foreigners. But some claim the Britannia effect is worth at least £30 million a year. Skeptics think if a replacement's needed once the yacht sails into retirement in November, why not encourage private financiers to ensure Britannia continues to rule the waves? Its last voyage took the then Prince Charles to Hong Kong in 1997. In a pivotal moment, Charles attended the handover of the territory to China. Quite memorably, amidst the pouring rain, Charles gave a powerful and meaningful speech. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Governor, Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I have been asked by Her Majesty the Queen to read the following message. Five hours from now, the Union flag will be lowered and the flag of China will fly over Hong Kong. More than a century and a half of British administration will come to an end. During that time, Hong Kong has grown from a small coastal settlement into one of the leading cities and one of the greatest trading economies in the world. There have been times of sacrifice, suffering and courage. As Hong Kong has risen from the ashes of war, a most dramatic transformation has taken place. Millions of destitute immigrants have been absorbed, and Hong Kong has created one of the most successful societies on Earth. Britain is both proud and privileged to have been involved with this success story. Proud of the British values and institutions that have been the framework for Hong Kong's success. The 11th of December, 1997, marked the day the Royal Yacht Britannia was decommissioned. After one last look around the yacht, Her Majesty disembarked for the very last time. All the clocks on board were stopped at 3.01, the exact time she left the yacht. Um, for myself, it's a, it's a very poignant um, uh, day. Um, it's the end of an era. and and the end of something very special um, that uh, uh, we've all volunteered to do. And um, it's going to be very sorely missed.
Well, it was a day of giving great tribute and huge thanks for the splendid service of this wonderful ship of ours. Uh, she is now paid off, uh, and uh, we know how, where she will go to the future or the options. Uh, but for us all, it was being able to give this great tribute to this remarkable ship. And I know that everybody who joined us today felt as I did uh, the, strength, the, the strength of feeling in saying such an honorable farewell. We are gathered together in this ancient naval dockyard of Portsmouth this afternoon to worship Almighty God and to commemorate the paying off of the Royal Yacht Britannia. After more than 43 years of distinguished service to Her Majesty the Queen. We recall with thanksgiving the contribution made by the members of the Royal Yacht Service and the Royal Household, past and present, in Britannia's historic career in the service of the Crown at home and abroad. We mark with affection the part that the Royal Yacht has played through her distinctive presence throughout the world. We acknowledge the contribution made by those who share with us in this ceremony, but upon another shore and in a greater light, whose loyalty and devotion is known to God alone. It is one of the few times Queen Elizabeth has broken her composure. Shedding a tear at the ceremony, she said goodbye to her floating palace, to her sanctuary. The Royal Yacht Britannia made its final journey. For the Queen, this yacht had been a faithful friend a place where she could escape the pressure of public life and relax amongst friends and family. It was the yacht that sailed her home from her first Commonwealth tour. It was the yacht that took her family away on holidays following happy wedding days. It was where she carried out so many of her royal duties and met countless dignitaries around the world. But most of all, it was a home. Thank you.